That device. My temporal loom. The way it's used. The temporal loom is a failsafe. The way it's woven into the tapestry of the narrative of Loki season two is absolutely brilliant. G'day, I'm RJ. Welcome to the Nerdy Dad channel. Let's talk about Loki season two. And I can't begin to tell you how relieved I am that Marvel turned in one excellent season of streaming. I love this series. I mean, season one as well, but especially season two. I loved it from start to finish. Picking up right where season one left off and continuing through right to where we got to at the end. Now, it's only a couple of days since I did my uh, episode six, my finale review, and I love where this show ends up. But for, before we talk about that, let's talk about the season as a whole and the way it's constructed. And I like the two very clever plot devices they use you know, throughout the whole series, and that is the loom. I like the way the loom is used, what we think it is and what it actually is, put so succinctly by He Who Remains. And then there's time slipping, which, you know, we understand that Loki can control it. Well, not initially. Um, but we don't actually know a lot about it. He Who Remains sort of hints that he was responsible for it, that he paved the way. So he didn't necessarily do it himself, but he cleared the way for it to happen. But we don't know what he did. As I said, even how it works. However, what we do know is that it is a really good plot device to get Loki where he needs to be through the whole series, but especially in that final episode. But let's go back to the start. We thought that, well, I thought, that time slipping was, well, it was a really big thing in the end. But something I appreciated about the series was the pace, the pace of the series. I mean, it was slow. Well, no, it wasn't slow. It was deliberate from start to finish. They obviously went in with a plan. I mean, this is Marvel at its best. Marvel has a plan, usually. Phase one, two, three, they had a plan. Phase four and five, I'm not as sure. Multiversal Saga has had really good moments, like Loki season two, and some moments that aren't terrible, terrible in the greater scheme of movies, but they're certainly not the MCU at its finest. But Loki season two is a high point, and there was a clear plan. There was a clear plan... In season two, there was a clear plan from season one to season two. It was a complete arc. I'm actually in the process of re-watching season one right now. But in some ways, you don't have to because it does the greatest hits at, at, the end of this, um, at the end of episode six anyway. But yeah, so time slipping. In the first episode, well, I like that we solved, well... We thought that we solved time slipping in the very first episode. There was a problem and we solved it in the same episode. As I said, this, this series moves at, moves at quite a clip. Um, and it's great. We go back in time. We meet Victor Timely. We think that maybe he is he who remains, but apparently not. Or maybe he would have been if given a chance, but no, he was a variant. And we know that Kang only allows the sacred timeline to exist. So for him to exist, then, then only the sacred, he must have been on the sacred timeline. And we know that Timely is a variant. Now, I find it fascinating that this Timely is a variant. He was born in the past. Timely in the comics, as a lot of you would be aware, actually is Kang the Conqueror, just living in a different time. He's actually from the distant future. 
But yeah, this Victor Timely was born in the 1800s, lived in the 1800s, was a brilliant inventor. Um, because of Ravona, he gets the information on the TVA, has knowledge of things that are above his ability to, not to comprehend, he understands them, but the technology isn't there in his time in order to do what he wants to do. He cannot build the time machines, he cannot build the temp pads with the technology of his era. And yeah, Timely to me is a fascinating character. OB, it's hard to believe that the first season existed without OB. As I said, I love these new characters of OB, of Victor Timely, or well, even though Victor Timely is a variant of a character that's not new, regardless. Love the inclusions of these new characters. And as I said, also that this series moves at quite a clip because by the end of the fourth, and this is only a six episode series, like many of the Disney Plus series, whether it be Marvel or Star Wars, it's too damn short. But in this case, the short actually worked for it. This series moved with purpose. It accomplished its goals, and, and it wa there was no filler because it was just go, 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 go. By the end of the fourth episode, I didn't know what was happening next because we've fulfilled every goal, everything that I thought we were working towards was done. We saw the other side of Loki's time slipping, his future self, pruning his past self. So that was done. That's what I thought we were building towards. But it happened in episode four. We had Timely and Obi built the device. They went to deploy the device. That's what we were building towards. And it happened, except it didn't. Everything blew up. And this was episode four. Holy shit. What, what a series to accomplish all they accomplished in four short, sharp, episodes to have you know the brad subplot which kind of went nowhere but what i did like was in in that second episode we got to see loki really being loki and you know that was brilliant it's one of the few times in the series uh, before the very end where we got to see a hint of loki as he was being Loki rather than a man in a suit at the TVA. Um, yeah. The 1893 episode was fantastic. I loved that aesthetic. We did a lot of time slipping and a lot of timey-wimey stuff in some ways, but we didn't visit a lot of time periods. One thing I thought oh, back when Series 1 was coming out, I thought it would be more of a time cop sort of series where we visited more locations in history, more points in time. And, and we did get that to an extent, but we didn't really get that in either season. If there is one complaint, and I love this series, so it's not much of a complaint. If there's one complaint I've got is that we didn't get more that we didn't see more timelines, that we didn't get Loki in history solving you know, solving crimes for the TVA, I don't know. Um, but I suppose with pruning being such a big thing, that kind of ruled that out, especially in season one. But yeah, the two big plot points, time slipping and the loom. And of course, we end up, you know, yeah, Loki... Time slips and time slips and time slips. Gets faster and faster and faster. And they solve the loom problem. Victor Timely gets out there. They shoot the device. And it's still too much because there's an infinite number. We can't expand the rings enough for an infinite number of timelines, which kind of makes sense. It's a scaling problem. Only we find out it's not. That he who remains designed the device to fail. It's a fail safe. It protects only the sacred timeline. Everything else is doomed. And I love that we revisit the end of season one at the end of season two. 
This is an Ouroboros. This is so many times things have looped and looped. This series, we have Mobius. Mobius, of course, is an infinite loop. Ouroboros is an infinite loop. And, you know, two of the characters' names. But we get this loop back to the first season. And we meet He Who Remains again. And he lays it all out for Loki. Things are going to happen the way I want them to happen. This is the only way. You cannot win, no matter how many times you do this. It's the same two options. Kill Sylvie and work for the TVA, protect the sacred timeline, or everything dies. All timelines are eradicated. And of course, you know, as I said in my discussion a couple of days ago, these wonderful heartfelt conversations with Mobius, with Sylvie, and Loki finds another option. He becomes the Scott of Stories, becomes the Yggdrasil, the Tree of Life. And we get caught with these time loop questions. As I said, we've got these loops, these infinite loops. Was Loki always the Tree of Life? Is Loki the Tree of Life because that's what you know, was in his own childhood? Or was he that thing from his own childhood? Um, you know, as laid out in Norse mythology, as Thor describes to Jane all the way back in the first Thor movie, things have come full circle. And it's a fantastic, this, especially the final episode, but this whole series, if this is the end for Tom Hiddleston, if this is the end for the MCU's Loki. I cannot imagine a more perfect send-off for the character from the god of mischief, from a murderous villain, um, from this selfish, well, I was going to say person, but god, to an actual God in his powers, like we're not talking, you know, a little bit of magic. He's a God because he's an Asgardian. The level of power he gains, this real cosmic God level power where he is time. He basically becomes time or at least in control of time. It's, it's this brilliant Brilliant heart, but it's grounded. This cosmic level stuff is grounded in emotions. Way back in season one, he was selfish, he's only in it for himself. He backstabs, he's just trying to get out of there, and then he forms connections connection with Mobius, connection with Sylvie, um, to a lesser extent with B15. Connection this season with Obi, even Victor, a variant of he who remains, a, the person, the being he is scared of. These connections. And he fights for them. He sacrifices himself for them. It is a real redemptive arc. It's, it's better than Darth Vader sacrificing himself for Luke. Because he doesn't die. His sacrifice is eternal service. He doesn't get what he wants. He doesn't spend time with Sylvie. Yes, he gets his throne, but it's, it's the weight of responsibility. It is crushing. And it's redemption. And power. And he has earned his throne, his glorious purpose, his burden, Loki, the god of stories.